Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and I want to be clear, too, you know, being in, in a physical space is kind of like being in a romantic relationship almost. Right. You don't you don't want to romanticize it. You can't romanticize romance. There is <laughs> nothing perfect. And so, right. you, you know, you get people thinking this, there's this perfect thing. They're going to be jumping from relationship to relationship, looking for something that doesn't exist. Everything is going to take work. And so, you know, I look at the physical spaces like that, too. One question uh, I mean, so for me, there were a number of things on one level. I've been kind of insulated from a lot of that stuff because I work in black studies. I work in higher education, which is a kind of protective environment in and of itself. And I chose a Pan-African studies department. I'm a political scientist by training, but I knew coming up out of, of, of um, undergrad and then coming out of, out of graduate school, I was like, if I go back to an HBCU, then I'll work in a political science department. But if I go to a predominantly white university, I'm going to work in black studies because I got to have a situation where I'm going to be makes around my, my people every day. Right. That makes sense for me. And that's that's been good. And two, geographically for me, Louisville is still relatively close to Atlanta. So I get I have over the years gone home a lot. Right. Not as much since my grandmother died and my daughter was born. But so it, it's it's almost like being a professional athlete. This is kind of my in-season base of operations, right? But I've never <laughs> yeah. really considered it home, to tell you the truth. So, you know, you, you, you do your work. But I think you all make, make great points. You're not saying that you're better than anybody. You're just saying that your worldview is very, very different. And, and It is different. And that's why, you know, people, people here all the time tell me they think I'm crazy and, and all that type of stuff. And, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Whatever you yeah. say. Oh, you have I'll a very clear opinion. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you, you're mentioning, uh, you know, Pan-African Studies, the department at uh, University of Louisville. And when I hear that term, I can't help but think of W.E.B. Du Bois. So uh, just considering certain mentalities and talking about world worldviews, uh, you know, there was a sort of back and forth of uh, ideologies as far as with the black community. So you have, you know, W.E.B. W.E.B. Du Bois, then you have Booker T. Washington. Uh, (laughs) So (laughs) what, um, considering those two individuals, and I I consider both of those individuals as influential individuals, um, what do you think uh, the difference of their ideologies uh, were? And uh, which one do you think has been more embraced across this nation or even particularly in the region? (laughs) Second question is has an easy answer, and it's it's Booker T. Washington, who who's been much more embraced. But that's a really really bad reality, though, when you understand the history of what we're talking about. Right. You know, you in, in fact, not just the region. I would say across the country in black communities that have been dictated to by white communities. Like you will consistently find historically these Booker T. Washington schools in black communities. Then you ask yourself why. When you understand the history of these two individuals, of course, Du Bois, first first black person to get a Ph.D. from Harvard University, a titanic uh, intellectual. But what people people want to talk about Harvard all the time. But what they don't remember is that Du Bois actually went to undergraduate school at Fisk. And Du Bois talked about how going to Fisk was the place that gave him his racial awakening. Very much like me. People know I went to Morehouse my junior and senior year. I'm a Morehouse grad, right? I'm a Morehouse man. But my first two years of college, I went to the U.S. Naval Academy. That's how I got so familiar with Howard, Dana, because mm-hmm. I was in D.C. a lot because it's only about 50 miles away from Annapolis. Absolutely. Right? So, but what, what Du Bois, but Du Bois, and people are, are, are pushed, they're, they're put off by this. Du Bois was an elitist, okay? We, we, we can't get away from that. I mean, he's a black man with a PhD, got a PhD in 1895. He's teaching a higher ed. He's writing for the crisis. He is really, really driving that conversation. He is an integrationist, but he is very, very wedded to black people. And he has the idea that black people should be able to uh, participate in America fully and completely as citizens through any profession that they would choose. Sure. It, here's where Washington is different. Here's where Washington, well, here's where Washington's different. Washington goes to Hampton. Washington's mentors, General General Samuel Chapman Armstrong, you know, the the white head of Hampton, who has an accommodationist mentality. Hmm. His idea is that Black people should only have access to industrial education. 
right? And through that industrial education, they're going to hold the lower tier jobs and lower tier professions in the country, but they're not going to be the highly trained professionals, the lawyers, the doctors, you know, the presidents, the politicians, all of that stuff. That wasn't Hampton's role. Washington takes that same mentality to Tuskegee, where he becomes the president, right? This accommodationism. So think about this. In 1895, the same year that Du Bois gets his PhD from Harvard, Washington goes to Piedmont Park in Atlanta. They have the Atlanta Exposition. It's supposed to be a celebration of the re-rising of the South, right? Washington walks into this hall to give a speech. Only black man there. White people are looking at him like, what the hell are you doing here? I mean, they are, they are looking at him like they could kill him. When he finishes that speech, though, white women are literally giving him roses, so you got to ask yourself, what in God's name did Booker T. Washington say in that Atlanta exposition address that had white people who were sneering at him when he comes in, giving him roses when he heads out? It was an, a speech of acquiescence where he, he literally talks about things like we followed, you know, your, your mothers and fathers with tear dimmed eyes to their graves. We'll make uh, prosperous the waste places that you leave us. You know, we will lay down our lives in defense of yours. We can be uh, as separate as the fingers in, in all mm. things social, one is the hand in all things for mutual progress. He is supporting segregation. He's supporting accommodationism. He's supporting a tiered society. And that's why Du Bois fights against that. But Du Bois wasn't the only one. Du Bois fights against it. William Monroe Trotter fights against it. Ida B. Wells Barnett fights against it. John Hope, who's the president of Morehouse College at the time, fights against it. So there are black people fighting, but do, but Washington is the most powerful black man in America until his death in 1915. So powerful, he is, he is so funded by rich whites, you know, northern elites, that he gave up his salary at Tuskegee. He didn't even have to take a salary. He was smoking fine cigars, riding his horse De Dexter in the morning. So it makes sense, actually, that white America would push the ideology of a Booker T. Washington sure. on to Black American. And unfortunately, over the years, a lot of folks celebrate Booker T. and they forget what he really pushed. You know, so who's been more influential? Washington has been, you know, outside of certain circles. You talk Black intellectual circles, of course, you know, yeah. that's it's going to be Du Bois. But that's a small population of people. Remember, right at 2%, only about 2% of America's population has PhDs. Right. That's a small yeah. percentage of people. And only about five percent of America's professorate is black. Yeah. So you're talking about a really, really small number of people. So that's a great question. I'm sorry I answered so long, but we could do no, a whole a great podcast answer. on, on great answer. Yeah. Washington. Yeah. Yeah. People people need to go back and, and read up on, on Booker T and read up on, on Du Bois and read up on all the black intellectual contributors of the time. Yeah. So what's interesting about that? So Part of my purpose here is to talk about the financial impact of all of that on Black people, right? So if you think about those two ideologies and then what the impact is that Booker T. Washington's uh, ideology has been more accepted, what does that mean for us? Well, we know the answer, right? <laughs> but it's kept us behind, um, point blank, period. And so do you have any thoughts on even how we can overcome that? Yes, there's a move for Black entrepreneurship. You know, Black Wall Street just opened, reopened in um, Atlanta. I see all that. And there's tons of different portals and apps and all of those things. But are we really doing what's necessary to pull out of that mindset, to pull each other up and to progress and be a success later? I don't know. It hmm. seems that way, but I'm not sure we're pulling everybody, bringing everybody with us. So it then is that going to create this elitist society again, if there ever was one? Well, you know, there are a few, few, way, few things that I would contribute to that conversation. One of the good contributions that Booker T. Washington did make was the idea of Black economic nationalism. You know, he, he, he talked about that. He talked about this building of Black communities, but they still would be tiered in their interaction with white communities. Here's what I see happening with us right now, though, and I've been surprised by it, but I think it's picking up speed. 
first of all, we're always going to have elites. You, you know, there are always going to be some black elites. So let's let's stop talk, thinking about white folks for a second. Just black folk. There are always going to be black elites. The question is, how are black elites socialized and what will their mission be? You know, when Du Bois talked at the turn of the 20th century about the talent of 10th, he was talking about roughly the 10 percent of black people who got bachelor's degrees. We still have not doubled that yet. Black women get more than, than about 20 percent of black women are getting bachelor's degrees, probably about 17 percent of black, 17 percent of black men, maybe a little bit less, actually. So black women are outpacing black men in that. But collectively, we have not doubled that talent to the 10th number in you know, yeah, a century and a quarter, doggone yeah. near. You know, but so but we're gonna have black elites. Nothing ever was handed. All of the respect, never about ego. Wish I could have retired a long time ago and disappeared way beyond the trees. But my homies kept influencing me. Said they needed to hear my lyrics, like my flow, cause they felt my spirit. Plus, the people needed to hear it. A conversation with conscientious lyrics.